So we recently discussed how to make enolates. Let's talk about other reactions we can do with these enolates besides alkylation. So the alpha halogenation reaction is useful in a couple of contexts. It is the precursor of the hell volhard zelensky reaction in which we can use to make alpha amino acids. It's also a precursor of the haloform reaction which we can use as a test for methyl ketones. So let's just take a close look at this mechanism. So we can see from the slide that we have an acidic alpha hydrogen that we can remove with an appropriate base. Br2 is considered to be a nonpolar molecule, but once it begins to approach the negatively charged carbon, it will become polarized. So the bromine that's closest will be electrophilic. The electrons attack that electrophilic bromine and we break a bromine-bromine bond to essentially substitute a hydrogen for a bromine atom. So let's take a closer look at that mechanistically. First I want to show you the static mechanism picture on the slides. So we have a proton transfer forming an enolate that is resonance stabilized. Remember from our previous discussion So remember, even though in terms of charge stability, and this is an argument that Cardi makes that is incorrect. According to charge stability, the top resonance form is more stable. Oxygen is better positioned to stabilize a negative charge than carbon because it's more electronegative. In terms of bond enthalpies, however, the carbon-oxygen double bond much more stable than a carbon-carbon double bond. In fact, if you were to look at the bond enthalpy of a carbon-oxygen double bond and a carbon-carbon single bond versus a carbon-oxygen single bond and a carbon-carbon double bond, you would find that the bottom structure is lower in energy. The carbon-oxygen double bond is lower in energy relative to the carbon-carbon double bond by about 100 kJoules per mole. Also, in nature, we find that C alkylation occurs much more frequently than O alkylation. And that's what the mechanism is showing. It is showing not C alkylation, but C bromination. We're making a CBr bond, not an OBr bond. Again, pay particular attention to the arrow pushing. Tail of the arrow, where the electrons originate. Tip of the arrow, where the electrons attack. Double-headed arrow means we're moving two electrons. Hydrogen's monovalent, so it gives up its bonding electrons that it was sharing with carbon to the more electronegative carbon atom. These, of course, are in resonance, and we show a CBr bond being made and a BrBr bond being broken. The end product is that we have an alpha brominated molecule. So a nice application of this chemistry is the iodoform reaction. And we use the iodoform reaction to test for the presence of a very specific type of ketone called a methyl ketone. So let's imagine that I have acetophenone, which is sometimes called phenyl methyl ketone. If you'll notice, we have three acidic alpha hydrogens that can be successively deprotonated and replaced by iodine in a mechanism identical to that we just discussed. So if I have an excess of NaOH and molecular iodine, we will have a proton transfer 
and of course we know that I am showing the less stable <clears throat> resonance structure being formed. Of course, water is a side product from this step. And again, this is a proton transfer. Now, this product, and I'm going to abbreviate this as phenyl, this is the less stable resonance contributor. I'll show the conversion to the more stable resonance contributor, which I will render in red. Now, molecular iodine, <clears throat> again, will approach, and the iodine that is closer to the lone pair on our nucleophilic carbon atom will shift its electron density so that I have an induced dipole. So nucleophilic attack, loss of the leaving group, you're talking SN2, and the net is that I've replaced a hydrogen with an iodine. Then I have another equivalent of the base that has another proton transfer. You have the two resonance structures. You have nucleophilic attack, loss of a leaving group. You replace another hydrogen with iodine. And you repeat this a third time. So where I want to go next is after this third time. Because I'll still have an excess of base in the reaction system. And I'm emphasizing these iodines in yellow because this precipitate is a bright yellow complex that we call iodoform, which is why this is called the iodoform reaction. So now my next equivalent of hydroxide will no longer perform a proton transfer, but rather nucleophilic acyl addition. So we'll attack the carbonyl carbon. That's nucleophilic addition. That pi bond will break, which gives us a tetrahedral intermediate. Normally, the carbonyl will not form, but I have three electronegative iodine atoms that will allow this carbon to be a good leaving group. Three appears to be the magic number. If I only have two, it won't leave. If I only have one, it won't leave. The only way it will have three is if this is a methyl group, which is why this is a test for methyl ketones. This reaction isn't as popular with the explosion of the capabilities with spectroscopic equipment like FTIR, NMR, and mass spec, but it's still very nice methodology in which to determine if we have a methyl carbonyl. Now notice this has a negative charge, 
but it's quickly going to be alleviated because it's going to perform a proton transfer on the carboxylic acid. This leads to another unexpected reaction. We are normally trained that we cannot oxidize a ketone, but we can oxidize a methyl ketone to a carboxylic acid. All I would need to do is to acidify this at the very end of the reaction. So here's the iota form. If I perform this with molecular bromine, I get bromoform. If I perform this with molecular chlorine, I wouldn't advise that because it's a gas. And chloroform just makes you look like a snatcher van dude. So probably not the best ID in the world. But the premise is exactly the same. I have validated that I have a methyl ketone as evidenced by the halo form precipitate. Last but not least, let's look at what I can do with a long chain carboxylic acid. I can react this with PBR3 in the first step. Now, if we think back to some chemistry we very recently learned, I could convert an alcohol to an alkyl bromide with PBr3. In fact, we did a video on this just the other day. So if I react a carboxylic acid with PBr3, I'm going to get the acyl bromide. This is functionally going to act as a protecting group. Notice I also have two alpha hydrogens. I can react this with a source of base. And yes, you guessed it, molecular bromine. this is going to give me an alpha bromo compound. Now from this I can react the bromo compound with ammonia. This would be step three. And in the final step, I can use acid catalyzed hydrolysis to return the acyl bromide to the carboxylic acid. And you will notice that I have produced an alpha amino acid. These reactions collectively are known as the Hell Volhard Zelensky reaction. I mean, how cool would it be to take an organic class taught by Dr. Hell? I mean, not only is the class Hell, but your instructor literally is Hell. I need to change my last name. So we have seen now how we do the alpha halogenation, and we've seen two interesting synthetic utilities. The iodoform reaction, which we use to identify a methyl ketone, and the hell volhard zelensky reaction, in which we functionalize a carboxylic acid, make the alpha bromo compound, do an SN2 reaction, and replace the bromine with an amine and then finally hydrolyze it back so that we have an alpha amino acid. Just an idea of one way we can make amino acids in the laboratory.